Psalm 119. So while you're looking up that, uh, I'll just tell you this this afternoon when I went, that also reminds me, I was, I was up on a place called Blueberry Hill. How many of you know where that is? Uh, they, they're not cutting it down anymore, so you can hardly see the lakes. Uh, so I don't know what's going on. We, you know, we may have some tree huggers up there trying to, trying to you know, save a wasp's nest or something. But um, 37.5, thank you. Yeah, I still had a beautiful view of the lakes, but there's no more of the, no more of the sloping hill. And no more. If you can find a blueberry there now, you're lucky. It's, out in, it's in Belgrade, actually in Rome. But I just felt led today to go up there and do my studying. And uh, I, talk, I was talking to Celeste uh, on the way home, and she said, well, you know, how come you didn't go to your office? You've got your, your desk there and your computer. And I said, yeah, I know, and I, I didn't really have anything to say, but as I'm driving home, I started thinking about everything that happened, and when I got home, I told her, I said, well, I, I, it's because I was led to go there. While I was sitting there studying, praying, and just going through multiple different scriptures, looking for a direction, he gave me a great message, which is, looks like it's going to be my Sunday message now, um, this car pulls up next to us and there are two elderly couples there and they're very talkative and they, they have New Jersey accents and they're probably, let's see, they're my sister Judy's age, maybe a little older, so that would make them 679 and, and uh, so they're talking, one couple is, friend, you know, they're good friends with the other couple, you know, I'm able to pick this all up because they're so quiet. Uh, they're staying with them. They're, they're, they live in Mount Vernon right now, and the other couple still lives in, in New Jersey. And so they're walking around, and the guy's all excited. I want to show you this, and maybe we'll pick some blueberries. And as he's walking down, he's going, wait a minute, wait a minute. And so he yells at his wife, don't bother to walk down. It's not worth the effort. He says, everything's been grown over. You won't find a blueberry here. And he said, well, maybe we can go down, and, and there's, well, there's a big rock you used to be able to sit on and see the other end of, of Long Pond. And you can't see that anymore. They've got the whole clearing down there, but they've, they've, and they've kept that clear, but the rest of the trees they haven't trimmed back, so now it blocks the view from the lake that way. And they were kind of disappointed. And uh, so they just started laughing and joking and you know, making the best of the situation. And uh, they add, one of the friends asked him, well, what's the name of this place? And he said, Blueberry Hill. Well, the next thing I know, the four of them are down there. I have found my thrill <laughs> on Blueberry Hill. They're trying to remember their song. And they're messing the words up and they're laughing. And I, I couldn't help but hear it. I mean, they, so as they're coming back up, I'm studying. And, and the Spirit of the Lord told me, he said, go on YouTube and find Fats Domino and play Blueberry Hill loud enough for them to hear it. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's going to be... But I did it. I put it on, you know, and I kind of I toned it down a little as they got closer, because I didn't want to think, this, this guy's a weirdo, right? But uh, I had it up loud enough so that when they came around the car, they were parked, you know, maybe... I, I, was, I was like here, and their car was parked over just the other side of the, uh, of the podium. And uh, this one little lady walks up and puts her head by, by my window and said, what's that? And so I turned it up. And so she said, oh, he's playing Blueberry Hill. And they all, they all came over and, and we started talking. And I had my Bibles, you know, laid out and, and my, my laptop and, I mean, my tablet and everything and my notepad. And the man's looking at my Bible and, and he said, are you pastor? And I said, I said, yeah, I am. He said, wow. He said, that's interesting. He says, when I was a young man, I, w I started out to, to uh, go to seminary to become a Baptist minister myself. He said, and then he ended up in the electrical field. But uh, he, he got talking to me. Then I met his wife. And then I met the other couple. You know, they, they told me, the first couple says, well, we're from Mount Vernon. These are our friends from New Jersey. And I said, well, we're in New Jersey. And they said, Tom's River. I said, uh, Tom's River. I said, I, I have an acquaintance who pastors 
a church in Tom's River. And he said, uh, what's his name? And for a second, you never have your mind go blank. I, can, I, could tell you, I could tell you every mark on the guy's face, and I couldn't think of his name. And I'm think, I said, big Italian guy, great testimony. His whole family was in the mafia. The guy from New Jersey goes, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, what's in that? St I said, yes, Tony Storino. He says, I've been to that guy's church. And I, I laughed, and so I opened my door, and was sitting there talking, and because I, I, I will sit in the back of the van, you know, so I have more room. But anyway, I slid the door open and we start talking. And the whole conversation revolves around the Lord. And this first couple, they haven't been to a church in a very long time because of some events that happened to them. And it just kind of turned him sour. But he very much loved the Lord. And uh, so this guy says, yeah, I said, he said, man, I, I said, well, how did you enjoy it? I said, he scared the peanuts out of me. <laughs> you know, got to understand, Anthony Storino, literally, his entire family is in the mafia. He's got, he's, he's got brothers that are still in the mafia. And uh, he looks like he's, he could have been an actor easily in any one of the three Godfather movies. <laughs> and he's got that Italian voice to go with it. And he said, he gave an altar call. He said, and he was so intense and so intimidating. And he said, I'm saved. He said, but I, next thing I know is my hand's starting to go up <laughs> to, for the altar call. And he said, just about when I'm holding it down, he said, just about when, when I think he's done, he said, he leans over and he says, I know there's at least one more hand out there trying to go up. I said, oh, no, he saw me. You know, so he's trying. But he said, he said, the guys, well, I said, are you going back to the church? You know, going? He said, no, man, no, that, he, he's intimidating. But we got talking, found out that guy's related to a Jewish, he's, his wife is Jewish. But she has no problem with the Lord. She goes to his Christian churches, he goes to her synagogue. And she's, man, she's about that close. And I said, wow, that's interesting. My Savior's Jewish. And she smiled and she said, yeah, I know, isn't that great? And I'm thinking, wow, this lady is getting close. But as we got talking, and I, I listened to the, the first man, the one from Mount Vernon, he'd had some very serious medical problems in his life, and he was desperate for answers. And he, he just couldn't, he couldn't find anything beyond basically them telling him to you know, prepare to, you know, to have a shorter lifespan. And he came across the scripture. He says, I said, I started looking through the Bible everywhere I could find. I read books. And so I came across this scripture. So the plans that I have, for, he didn't say it this way. I ended up quoting it to him after, but it's, this is the scripture. The plans I have for you are for good and not for evil. Amen. Plans to bless you and not to harm you and to give you a successful end. And he said, that's the one, that's the one. And he was so excited that uh, he was dancing. And he's a big guy, he's, he's, he's tall. He, 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 uh, Physique-wise, without the gut, he's big like Bill G. And uh, he, he was an educator for most of his life. And his best friend was his first student who was a grown man when he went to the school in his first class, his first day ever teaching. And they've been friends ever since then for like 50 years. Uh, but we talked, oh, 45 minutes just because of, uh, of you know, just that stopping over. And when I left, they, they left, I finished, I was having a hard time getting my notes together. As soon as as soon as they left, God took me right to, to, to my verse and, and gave me an entire message. But it's not for tonight, evidently. So I'm going to give it Sunday. But it just flowed before I was having a terrible, difficult time. So as I'm driving home after my conversation with Celeste, I, I walked in and I said, Celeste, you know why I wasn't at the office today? And she said, why? I said, because I had an appointment. I was supposed to be there. And 
that's something that I want to talk to you about tonight. If you look at Psalm 119, verse 105, it says this, My word is a lamp. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. This is David talking to the Lord. And a light unto my path. We think about the word of God as being strictly doctrine, and it is. I mean, it's, it's the written word. It's not only the history of, of God's presence on this earth and where he's, and, and the journey that he's leading mankind through to finally come to a savior and what the end result is going to be, which is an eternity with the Father. And we look at that and we look to it for advice and so forth, but I think we forget that, that one scripture that says the word is alive. We, when we think of the word, most of the time we think of the Bible. But the Word is God. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And so it's a, the Word, we need to stop looking at the Word as simply a book, but as a personality. That's right. Mind. Thoughts. Emotions. That's right. Wisdom. A mouth to converse. Amen. A heart to understand. I mean, it, it's alive. He's alive. And we, when we're asking God for direction, we're really asking the Word for direction. It's funny. We look to the Word for direction, but when we want direction, we ask the Lord. It's the same thing. You're talking to the same one. As a matter of fact, if you're looking for direction and somebody gives you direction according to the things of God, but it doesn't line up with Scripture, it's, not, it's, it's misdirection. Anybody here ever, ever back, I, this is before all the electronic stuff, but AAA used to give out what they called triptychs. Remember those? Page by page directions. Now, one of the worst things that can happen is that the person who's putting these together, because they'd print them out and put them together by hand, and then they'd highlight them, is to get a couple of them mixed up. So you could be like in the, in the middle of Georgia, and the next thing, your, your next two pages are New Jersey. Or the, and the page you're looking for is missing. That's human wisdom. That's human understanding. It always fails us. That's why we need to go to the Word. If you can't find it in the Word, Amen. then one, you're either not looking for it, or God's already given you directions He's waiting for you to follow first. God never gives us new directions until we follow the directions He's given us first. Mankind, by our nature, is not a type of nature that does well with five steps if they're given all five steps at once. Because our nature is to start with step five. Nobody wants to start with step one. I mean, we go to, when, when I got to high school, I couldn't wait to get to high school. When I got to high school, I couldn't wait to graduate. When I joined the military, I couldn't wait to go into the military. When I get in, I couldn't wait to get out. You know, no, not for a bad reason. But there was all, I, we're always so focused on the future that we generally waste the day. And it's because of that problem that we often get astray, mess up our doctrine, lose our confidence in listening to God or even the Word because we're not realizing that we're not going at the pace He wants us to go at. 
I don't know how many people that I've talked to that have said, I'm just praying for God, for what does God want me to do now? What does God want me to do now? What does God want me to do now? And, I, and he said, the more I pray, I, I don't hear anything, and it's frustrating. What can I do? So I'll always ask him, what's the last thing that God told you to do? And sometimes, you know, usually it's, it's not, you know, oh, yeah, well, uh, just a little while ago he said to do thus and such. But there are some times when the last thing they actually remember without question in their mind that God told them to do might be a year ago, two years ago, three or four or five years ago. And so I said, well, has he told you to do anything else since then? And they'd say, no. So what do I do? Do what they told you to do then until he tells you to stop. See, we always think God's just going to tell us what to do. We never stop to consider the fact that God will tell us when to stop. And that's what we need to listen for. Because if God doesn't tell you to stop, you're in his will. But we always want something new. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this the other day. Uh, I was listening to Jerry Savelle, uh, a wonderful teaching that he was giving. And he was talking to Brother Kenneth Copeland. And, and, and uh, this was a recent teaching. And he said he was talking to him and he said, he said, Brother Copeland, he said, Do you, have you noticed how, remember when we first started, he said, you couldn't find auditoriums big enough right. to get people in to the meetings. Right. And, and he said, people were upset if we went two nights. They wanted four nights. If we went four nights, they wanted seven nights. Right. And he said, it was, we were constantly being bombarded. Everybody was, was after it. He said, no matter where we went. He said, have you noticed how much the crowds have diminished? Have you noticed how much interest has diminished in the word of faith message? And Brother Copeland said, yeah. He said, what do you think it is? He said, oh, he said, it's easy. Most people leave because what they're running after has lost its entertainment value. See, when it goes from, when it stops being entertainment and goes to being truth that you must be educated in, you must be trained in and you must learn to walk in, they, they want to go to the next, the next greatest thing. And that's why most people never go anywhere in Christ. That's why everybody wants hoop, what I call hoop the, my, I call, my grandfather used to call hoop the law meetings. Do you know what hoop the law means? Jumping up and down, running around, yahoo, yahoo, yahoo. And there's nothing wrong with that, but if that's all you ever want, there comes a point in time when they've been doing it for a long time and they're not getting any results, or they're not, they're not, they don't feel like they're growing, their frustrations are still there. Wow, what's, what's the matter? And a lot of it is because the Holy Ghost lifted from that kind of a meeting and they were so busy creating it in their own life, they didn't even notice the Holy Ghost was gone. Some people want to live in perpetual revival. There's no such thing as perpetual revival. The Bible says we're changed from glory to glory, but we're not, and not everything changes us. When we were babies uh, and, we needed, and, and, and we needed change, it, it, it's a different kind of change than we needed when we, when we went from having all year as summer vacation and playing with our friends in the neighborhood to our first day getting on the school bus. Somebody needed to help us change, so we went to school. And then with every grade that we went through, there was more change. And then when we, got, when we got to high school, that gap, even though it's one year class grade, from eighth grade to freshman, there's a social jump that requires change. Amen? And so we need somebody to help us change that. In the natural, it goes that way all the time. You graduate from high school, then there's the change. You either go to work uh, you, when I graduated, you went to work, you went into the service, or you went to college. Uh, and each one required a change. Then the next thing you know, from the high school dating relationships to a serious relationship that ends up in a marriage, whoa. Go, just going from a, a, just a dating around situation to a serious dating situation requires a major change. 
And you can imagine, and, and, and those of you that are married know, when you go into that, that change of marriage, it's a major change. Well, the Bible says that we're supposed to change. The word is supposed to be changing us, making us more like Christ. But we read those scriptures and we say, okay, I've read the scripture. And I had a conversation with somebody recently, I think that'll play it out. You know, they, they were asking me, so well, what can I do to, to change this in my, in, in my life situation or to do that? And I would say, okay, well, the word says this and this, that, you know, develop this characteristic, develop that, have this attitude. And so they said, okay. And then the next time I talked to them, I, I don't know how long it was, but I said, well, how's it going? And they said, well, they had those scriptures memorized. They said, but nothing's happening. I said, well, are you doing them? Yeah, but nothing's happening. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Explain to me what that first one means. And as they're trying to explain it to me, they're missing the whole thing. They're missing the fact that, and, and the thing they were missing was that each one of those stages represented growth, potential, but required consistent application to grow into that next phase. Somebody, somebody, I can remember when I was in charismatic prayer meetings, way back, when, when, when all the denominations, Christian denominations, were getting the Holy Spirit. And we'd have these little prayer meetings at churches. This particular one there was, a, was at a, a Catholic church, and uh, the Pentecostals spent 20 years trying to get over that. And uh, that, that Christian Catholics got tongues and, and, the, and the manifestation of the Spirit, that about killed half their doctrine. They had to go back and change a bunch of stuff. So, because they didn't believe Christians were even saved, never mind could get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But we'd have these little prayer meetings and uh, somebody would have, you know, you would feel oh, boy, something's going on inside of me, and they'd start shaking inside, and, you know, because we were worshiping and stuff, and it got really quiet. And, and the, the, the leader of the meeting would say, is anybody getting anything? And these were all young, young Christians. I had come out of, I got born again in the Jesus People movement and was in, was in a, 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 a Maranatha church. And so we, I, I got an inundated and indoctrinated early on in, in Pentecost, um, and I knew what was going on, but I'm just visiting. So this leader is saying, you know, if you feel something stirring, it's probably the Holy Spirit trying to use you, maybe in a word or in a tongue. And this was tongues and interpretation was the height of supernatural activity in those days. I mean, forget lepers. We're, we're just, we're working to, woo, you know, heavenly language and an interpretation, God using us to speak to us. So they were seeing it as his voice, which it is. Mm -hmm. But for them, it was they were in awe. Yeah. And so somebody would come out and they would speak in tongues, and another person would be prompted to give an interpretation. And in the beginning, it was always these nice little, oh, my children, how I love you so very much. You know, continue in my word. Just lovely little things. As the meeting grew, as people got more involved, begin to find out what notice is certain people began to be the ones to speak in tongues most of the time. And then another person, uh, these other people would be the ones who would interpret. And so then the next thing we noticed is they'd start ta walking around and talking to each other, but well, wh what's your gift? I I I've got the gift of tongues to be interpreted. Oh, I've got the gift of interpretation, and another one might, who bypassed tongues and just gave a word. So, well, I've got the gift of prophecy. I, then, as you all know, you go to any church, I've got the gift of healings, I've got the gift of this and that. And, and the, you know, the sad thing is, I understand what they were trying to say, but the problem that they had was they were trying to possess something that didn't belong to them. Because all those gifts belong to the Holy Ghost. And it says, and he delivers them severally as he wills. 
the only difference between them and maybe somebody else in the church was that they had gotten over their discomfort and began to like the feeling of being the one who delivered, you know, part of the word. And uh, so they, so what happened was, is some of these people would start traveling around from prayer group to prayer group so that they could share their gift. And they now had a ministry. I mean, you could take everything they knew about biblical theology and put it in a thimble and still have room left for an ice cube. <laughs> you know, so it could be, but now they were in the ministry. And some of them actually had a call to the ministry, but their problem was they were living in tomorrow when they had not accomplished today. And we have to be very careful about that. God will never release you for another step until you fulfill the step he's put you in. There are a lot of people who have gotten married and had miserable lives because they didn't wait for the leading of the Lord. They had a word, your husband is coming soon, your wife is coming soon. And God helped the poor person that bumped into him next that even came close to fitting their bill. You know what I'm saying? And the next thing you know, they oh, the, you must be the one. God prophesied to me. Uh, you know the story about Kenneth Copeland. There was a lady from, from Fort Worth area who believed God told her that she was going to marry Brother Copeland. So she used to go to all of his meetings in a wedding gown. True. The sad part of it was, is he was already married to Gloria. And so a fellow that I know, who actually, I heard the story from him, he met her, and he asked her, well, what are you going to, he's already married. So, well, God told me she's going to die. So she did this, I guess, for like seven or eight years. Honestly. And finally, I guess she gave up on it, and hopefully she ended up finding the right guy but she wasted eight years of her life. God never told her that she was going to marry Kenneth Copeland. He said, I have a man for you. Uh, someone I know very well, God told her, says, I've got a man for you branded in the palm of my hand. And uh, when that person showed up, her first response to God was, no way. Shh. <laughs> Don't give away the but it's true. That happened with, with my wife. I was not what she was looking for. She'd never dated any guy shorter than 6'1". All right, all right. <laughs> but the... the, the, the <laughs> hallelujah. Thank God. But the point that I'm trying to make is we've forgotten. We've forgotten that the word, which is, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, and what we get in the Spirit has to agree with what we find in the Word. Amen. If it doesn't, we've got serious difficulties. And we're going to end up getting serious bumps and bruises. And, and in some cases, really messing up people's lives, their emotions, even their relationship with Christ for a long time. Because they've never understood, perhaps never been taught that the word is a lamp and a light to your path. And that until he light, puts light on the step past the one he has you taking, don't move. Sometimes the best way to be in God's will is to stop moving. So many people go from church to church to church to church. I mean... And it, it, it's, it, it happens all over the body of Christ. Back in the, I think it was the late 80s, early 90s, there was a song that came out. It was recorded in Tulsa. It was big back then, and it, it traveled all over the gospel route. But it was called The Church Hop. Did, did you hear that? Have you heard it? You shook your head. It was... Don't you be doing that church hop. Don't you be doing that church hop. If you get started, you just won't stop. So don't you be doing that church hop. And there's, there's a lot of other lyrics with it. But the whole point of the song was, 
Okay, God said to come here. Nope, I don't like it. So God said to come here. Nope, I don't like it. Or him or her or whatever. Oh, so God said to come here. Nope, I don't like it. Well, did God ever tell you to leave any of those? No, because he never gave them a chance. They just assumed that since they found another place to go, it were God's will. And it's not always. Sometimes the place that's God's will is the one place you get rubbed backwards like a cat. And he, have you ever done that? Somebody used to tell me cats hate to have that. I tried that once. I got scratched. They do not like it. And, and so that's part of the reason people don't want to live in the word they have now. One, they feel like they've been in that mode for too long and they want to be further along in their walk. So they step further along. Or the, God, the, walk, uh, the step that God puts them in, they're thinking, oh, great. I'm, this is what's going to be happening here when I go. Yeah. And, and what they end up being confronted with is that grating thing that God, the Holy Ghost, has been dealing with them about for years that they keep trying to sidestep, avoid, jump over, you know, put a disguise on so the Holy Ghost doesn't find them, and they find that, that bang, it's right there. And then, of course, the other part is, is the part that all of us suffer from. We are impatient to grow until we get past that age you know, I want it to be in, in, my, in my 30s, especially after I hit 40. <laughs> you know, and, I want, and, 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 and it goes with every year, but now that I'm at the age I want, I'm thinking, you know, God, how about one of those movies? I'll just go to sleep tonight, and I'll wake up. It'll be my junior year in high school. <laughs> you know, in the, na in the natural schools as a kid, and I've got, hand, I got scars on the back of my hands to prove it. Rulers leave marks. And uh, he, I said, well, can I read it? I was a creative writing major at college at the time, so I, he's writing, oh. So I get, the, I get that, and, and I start reading it, and, and I don't make it past the title. The Wicked Witch, W-I-K-E-T, W-I-C-H. And he got 100 with a gold star. Oh, boy. I wanted him to take me to school the next day. But my sister wouldn't let me. I wanted to go have a conversation with his teacher and find out where she went to teaching college. So, but I, that's how we are about ourselves when we want to grow and be something we're not yet. We either, we, one, we'll start acting like we are where we're not. We'll start pretending we know when we don't. We'll, I, forget the scriptures. You know, somebody says, sit down and learn. Oh, God, just shoot me and get it over with. I know this by heart. Oh, you do? Great. How are you feeling today? Oh, man, I said, it's flu season. I get it every year. Well, you know what the Bible says, by his stripes we're healed. Oh, I know that. Was it true? Absolutely. Do you have that in your heart? Well, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Are, are, you, man, are you getting the fruit of it all the time? <laughs> I'm like, why don't you go back and study that out a little more? And they get insulted. You know, this is not the most fun job in the world. Uh, the sermon that I have for Sunday talks about what, pa what, what a, a minister of the gospel has to go through it a little bit in what he has to teach. How many of you have found out that whenever God's used you to tell somebody something, a lot of the times it's exactly what they don't want to hear, even though it's true? It's like a wife trying to tell her husband he's wrong. 
And it's like a husband trying to convince her that, yes, what she's talking about is wrong, but that's not what he said. <laughs> uh, we, we have it go both ways. So remember, if you will keep the word of God, not somebody's opinion of the word of God, not a new revelation of what the word of God said is, but what the word actually says and allow it to light your path and stay in the lighted path and don't move from that path until he tells you to move. He gave us that example when he took the Hebrew children out of Egypt and what was leading them to the promised land. They were led by a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire by night. There were two reasons for the cloud and the pillar. One, well, more than, more than two. One of the reasons was it shaded them from the hot sun in the desert. At night, desert sand does not hold heat. and it, You can freeze to death in the desert. You can be in a country that's 100 degrees all the time and freeze to death at night in that country because the sand holds no heat. So there was a fire by night, but it also represented the Shekinah glory of God over the traveling tabernacle and, and the fire of God, the Holy Spirit, by night, which was, to rep, which was representing what would eventually be in our hearts. And they were told, when the cloud stops moving, you stop moving. And you stay there until the cloud moves again. Sometimes they'd stay for a day. Sometimes they'd stay for multiple days. Some, over the 40 years, I would venture to say that they stayed many days at a time in one place. But, they, but anyone who tried to go off on their own usually ended up dying in the wilderness. Uh, the Jewish historians talk about it. People who would wander off and get, get caught by uh, marauding, uh, marauding uh, tribes and so forth, that nomadic tribes in that area. When you try to tell, when they tried to tell Moses what God was saying, and this was only after Moses got it from God and he would tell them what God said and they would tell him back what God said. And it would never be what Moses said. I mean, they went through that a lot. There was always a problem. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to get to that place where I'm so determined to have it a different way and move a different way than what the leader is saying. I don't want the ground to open up and swallow me. And that happened twice. That happened when he came down from the mountain and it happened out in the desert when, when two men tried to become leaders and they got swallowed up. Then look what happened when they get to the edge of the promised land. They've already got God's direction. They've already seen him move in great power and authority multiple times defeating an enemy that they did nothing to help defeat except stand there. There's not one single thing that the Hebrews did to defeat the Egyptians. All they did was go where God said to go, stop where God said to stop. One of the, the biggest final battle with the Egyptians took place when God led them to a place where they couldn't go. They had to stand and wait. And they didn't move until it looked like the Egyptians were going to be on the top of their heads. But you see what God was doing is he was tempting the enemy. He opened the waters, led them across on dry land. The Egyptians saw it and said, well, we'll take our chariots. The minute their chariots got in the middle, said all, all the, dry, the solid land turned to mud. They couldn't move and then the waters caved in. And yet seeing all that, they get to the very edge of the promised land. And all the spies say, it is everything God said it was going to be. Let's go. Only two 
out of the 10 spies said, let's go. The rest said, oh, are you kidding me? Yeah, it's great. God didn't tell us about these giants. I mean, these guys are big. And we, as a matter of fact, when they looked at us, they saw us as grass, grasshoppers, and that's what we were. And so everyone over the age of 18 was, died in the wilderness waiting for the younger people who would pay attention and obey, stay when they said to stay, go when they said to go, got into the promised land. And only two out of everyone over 18 ended up going in, and that was Joshua and Caleb. And Moses didn't go because he went when God said stop. First time, strike the rock. Second time, speak to the rock. And he was so mad at the people, he disobeyed. And he went his direction, and he never made it into the promised land. So it's time we grow up. It's time we grow up. Where God has us is where he has us. So well, I don't know why he has us here. Why aren't I... Why aren't I learning more about this? Why aren't I progressing this way? Why isn't my job offering me this promotion? You know, why isn't the school teaching this thing? Why, you know, why this, why that? Get calm, get in God's presence, and say, you know, your Bible says, sufficient for today are the evils thereof, and you've given me victory over today's evils. So I will not take thought for tomorrow. You're going to have a much happier life, especially if you make sure you read, you do it just the way the word says. I hope that helped you tonight. Hallelujah.